So welcome to everyone. Um, I'm delighted to see uh, lots of people who are on the corporate finance law course um, joining us and a few names I don't recognize. So welcome to, to everyone. If you don't know who I am, I'm Louise Gallifer, um, a professor at Cambridge and, and with Anne Sophie Klutz, I run the um, corporate finance law course. Um, I came to Cambridge from Oxford and I taught for corporate finance there for, for many years. And one of the highlights of, of our course in Oxford was a talk by Chris Hale and either with William or with somebody called Emma Watford who are both working for Bridgepoint. So and they did this every year. So um, I, know, I, know, I know how the talk used to go. It's probably changed a lot this year. Um, just to introduce our speakers. So um, Chris Hale is the chair emeritus of Travis Smith. He's worked there um, for, for many years. Um, he uh, founded the Private Equity and Financial Sponsors Group at Trevor Smith um, uh, in 1996, and he's senior consultant there now. And he has done private equity, well, he will tell you, but he's been involved in private equity work all through his professional career uh, as a lawyer. And um, he's also a Cambridge graduate, which is lovely. So it's lovely to have you here, Chris. Um, and William is also a Cambridge graduate, but he's here because he's a partner um, of, of Bridgepoint, a uh, private equity house, and he leads the Bridgepoint financial services team. And I see from his bio, he was based in Madrid for a number of years, which sounds lovely, but anyway, he's now in London. Um, and um, he'll tell you, I'm sure, more about what he actually does in his working life as well. Um, just a few points um, before we get started. Uh, firstly, um, obviously, can you all mute? Well, I don't know, you don't have to mute yourself, sorry, that's, that's wrong. Don't worry about muting yourself. But what Chris and, and um, William are happy to do is to take questions as we go along, uh, rather than waiting for the end. Um, and, and that's always worked quite well in the past. So if something occurs to you and you'd like to know it, then um, you just uh, ask your question in the Q&A. Please put it in the Q&A and not in the chat, and then I will be able to monitor the, just one thing, which is great. So if you have a question or you want to ask a question, put it in the Q&A, and what we will do is call on you, and um, Daniel Bates, who's here, will um, make you a panelist, I think it's called, so that you can actually ask your question verbally. I don't have to transcribe it. So I don't feel you have to type out a very complicated question. Just say you have a question and we'll call on you and that will get some, hopefully get some discussion going. So that, that would be great. Um, there, there's going to be some slides. The slides um, are already, uh, the link for the slides is in the chat. So you can download them if you want to and you're certainly very welcome to do so. For those of you in the corporate finance class, um, um, this will um, very much inform what you'll be able to, um, to we'll, we'll be able to talk about on Monday, our seminars, and Chris has very kindly agreed to join those seminars as well. So we're going to have a, a really good, good talk about private equity both today and on Monday, I hope. Um, right, okay, I think that's everything. Daniel will tell me if I've got anything, forgotten anything, I think that's everything. So I'll now hand over to Chris, who I think is going to kick off. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you for both of you for coming and thank you for starting. Chris. Thanks, Thank Louise. Um, Louise is right. I have been working um, at Travis Smith for a long time. I joined it in 1983, so I'll be celebrating my 38th anniversary soon. I like to say I was a child protege, but that may be a bit of an exaggeration. Um, uh, for most of that time, I have practiced in what today we call private equity. When I started in 83, it was called venture capital, and that reflected the sort of size and type of deals that were done in those days. And so I've seen the market evolve into its current state. And what we will do this evening is uh, explain a little bit about that current state, um, how private equity got there, where it is, um, how important it is, um, how it works, both from the uh, fund perspective and the transaction perspective. Um, uh, and uh, we'll touch on some of the, the current trends. Now, what I'm going to do is share my screen, if I can, and talk to the slides. Um, uh, as Louise said, um, uh, do please ask questions. Don't be shy about it, because uh, if we uh, have questions, it sort of makes uh, the, the afternoon more interesting and lively for us as speakers, and I hope uh, for you as listeners. So um, one thing that uh, perhaps surprisingly there isn't in private equity is an agreed definition of what it is. Now, um, I've come up with my own formulation. So it's risk capital provided in a wide variety of situations, 
ranging from finance provided to business startups to the purchase of large mature quoted companies and everything in, bet in between. And there are some key elements to it. Investment in unquoted companies, equity capital by nature, medium to long term, and targeted at companies with growth potential. Um, if you're interested in private equity, there's an excellent book, uh, a colleague of mine at Travis Smith, Simon Whitney, has very recently published, by very recently, I mean in the last sort of five or six weeks, Cambridge University Press publication, and it's called Corporate Governance and Responsible Investment in Private Equity. Um, I hope he's going to give me a commission uh, if any of you purchase it for this uh, uh, promotion. But he adds to the definition of private equity by saying, a private equity backed company is a company whose shares are not traded on a public market and which has one or more significant professional investors who from the moment of investing have a declared intention to sell their investment at some defined point. Now what William and I are going to do is put uh, from the practitioner's point of view on all that. Now, where is where do you find private equity? Is it all over the world or is it concentrated? Well, the answer to that is it is still quite concentrated. Um, the US has been the main driving source of the growth of uh, private equity. It developed there, first of all, in the very late 1970s, began to accelerate through the 1980s and took off from the mid 1990s uh, onwards. And we'll illustrate this later with some uh, data. Um, uh, it then migrated to uh, the UK. Um, uh, it developed in the UK um, from the time I joined Travis Smith in 1983. Um, uh, it began to become a significant part of UK corporate finance from the late 1980s onwards. And that's the period when you saw it beginning to develop in um, other European economies. Uh, if you look at this slide, you can see that even today, roughly half of the capital which private equity houses invest is invested in North America, principally the, uh, the US. Uh, the, the, the dark blue side is the, uh, the one reflecting investment in uh, Europe. And in uh, most years, um, the UK accounts for something like 35 to 40 percent uh, of invested capital. In 2013, a non, uh, not untypical year, according to Incisive Media, one of the data compilers of MA statistics, the UK had a 40% share by volume of uh, European deals and a marginally smaller share by value. Um, and the UK is important for another reason, and that is London. London continues to be a major portal for private equity investment. Uh, that is, uh, London is the base from which private equity fund managers work and invest, not just in the UK, but elsewhere as well. And the evidence is actually that London is the most important portal in the world. Regrettably, uh, there is a question mark over uh, its mantle as uh, the global portal. Um, and that arises because of Brexit and the possible implications uh, of changes to regulations that might diminish uh, London's position. I mean, that's something we can pick up later if uh, any of you are interested. One thing that does interest me about the geography of private equity is why it hasn't developed as fast um, in countries outside uh, North America and um, uh, Europe. Um, an APAX report published in 2006 called Unlocking Global Volume, Future Trends in Private Equity Investment Worldwide, attempted to rank 33 countries by how congenial their private equity environment was, measured by various categories, such as whether they offered a stable regulatory framework, encouraged market-based competition, and had highly developed financial systems, as well as whether they adhered to the rule of law. Um, now, whether they are the right ways to judge uh, private equity uh, hospitality, I don't know. Uh, but the conclusions they came to were that the bottom two countries in the, this table of 33 countries 
um, were surprisingly, or perhaps not surprisingly, India and China. And if they are right, that perhaps explains why um, the expected growth of private equity in Asia, it started there probably in the late 1990s, early 2000s, took much longer uh, to take off than was expected at the time. And even today, as you can see, uh, it, a, Asian investment, and bear in mind Asia is a, a vast uh, area with a vast population and vast economies, um, is still much smaller uh, as a home for invested capital uh, than Europe and North America. Uh, I would expect Asia to gradually continue uh, its growth and eventually to overtake uh, Europe. When that will be, I don't know. I can't see it overtaking North America um, for many, many years, if it will at all. So in the countries where private equity is concentrated, in particular the UK and the US, how important is it? Well, you can see from this slide uh, that there are a lot of companies whose names you might recognize that are actually either now backed by private equity or were. I've put on the slide as a nod to William, uh, MotoGP, the AGB, which is um, uh, the motorcycle equivalent of Formula One. And that is a company uh, William looks after and has done so, I think I'm right in saying William, from the time Bridgepoint invested quite some years ago. Back in 2006, um, so 15, yeah, 15 years, 2006. So yeah, a long, a long hold for us, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And we'll talk about holds in a minute. Um, to put some data around the importance of private equity in the UK and the US, um, according to Bain, in 2013, private equity-backed companies accounted for 23% of America's mid-sized companies and 11% of its large companies. And those companies will obviously employ millions of people. Indeed, if you take together the portfolio companies of each of Carlisle, KKR, Blackstone and Apollo, four of the largest private equity houses, each of Carlisle, KKR, Blackstone and Apollo ranks among the 10 largest employers in the US. So very significant in the US in terms of the corporate population and employment. In the UK, I don't have up-to-date uh, statistics uh, of that sort. Um, I do have something uh, uh, from a consultancy called IA Consulting, uh, published in uh, 2007, um, when they undertook some uh, research on the importance of private equity. And their research indicated at the time around 3 million people in the UK, equivalent to 21% of the then current UK private uh, sector workforce, work for companies that either were or had been backed by private equity. Now, that number will be larger, probably quite a lot larger uh, today. So as you can see, private equity is important by a number of measures uh, in uh, the UK and the US, indeed very important. Um, uh, what about its uh, uh, effect on things like uh, employment and labor productivity? How important is that and is it better uh, than other forms of ownership. Well, there's been quite a lot of research on this subject, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of it is contradictory. The majority show that in relation to employment, um, a private equity does private equity backed companies increase employment at a faster rate than uh, listed companies. Um, the best piece of research that I've seen is. Um, uh, in a paper uh, um, that was published in October 2019 called The Economic Effects of Private Equity Buyouts. Um, that was uh, written by a number of uh, US academics, including Stephen Davis and Josh Lerner, who are quite well known in the sort of private equity academic world. Um, they uh, examined thousands of US private equity buyouts from 1980 to 2013 looking amongst other things at the effect of buyouts on labor productivity, compensation per worker and employment. And their overall con conclusion I will read out, and it's one that um, I think I would subscribe to. And this is what they say. In short, the impact of private equity is more complex and varied 
than champions or detractors claim. Proponents such as Jensen, who uh, you may or may not be familiar with his um, famous piece about um, the eclipse of the public company, see buyouts as engines of efficiency and value creation, fueled by the concentrated ownership of target firms, highly levered capital structures, and high powered financial incentives. Critics see these same features as harmful to targets and their workers and a source of systemic risk. We find strong support for the engines of efficiency view in the most prevalent deal types. With respect to employment and wage effects of buyouts, our evidence is mixed and contingent on deal type. The post buyout performance of target firms also varies with external credit and macroeconomic conditions. Their overall conclusion, and if you read the paper, you'll see it in more detail, broadly supports the Jensen type of view, giving a tick to private equity on most of the things that, uh, that they uh, looked at. How important is private equity to the M&A world? Uh, well, very important in the UK and the US. So the fees uh, that, that private equity houses pay each time they buy and sell a company provide a fifth of the global banking system's revenues from M&A, from mergers and acquisitions. And in the US and the UK, these numbers are higher. According to another uh, data uh, collector in uh, the private equity world, the Center for Management Buyout Research, buyouts accounted for over 30% by number of deals and 76% by value of deals in the UK. And the number of deals is actually a bit lower in uh, 2019 than it has been in most of uh, the last 10 years. It's usually 50% plus. And by contrast, worldwide, and reflecting what I've been saying about uh, geography, the numbers are lower. So overall, uh, um, private equity usually accounts for something like 15% of global m and uh, uh, value and 10% by number of deals. Now, has private equity been successful? William, I think you're gonna pick up here. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Um, so first of all, just um, uh, just a quick introduction uh, as to myself, um, and I'll um, try and sort of keep this brief. I can I can get as as deep or not as people like. So uh, feel free to probe, ask questions if there are things that you'd like to go further into. Um, from a practical side, and I suppose I'm I'm here to provide you with a bit of the practitioner's view as to what private equity is all about. Um, as Louise very kindly introduced me uh, at the beginning, um, my name is William Paul. I'm a partner at Bridgepoint. Uh, Bridgepoint is a what we would term a pan-European mid-market private equity firm. Um, uh, my background is, as, uh, as Louis said, I, I was a graduate in modern and medieval languages at uh, St. Catherine's College, also many moons ago. Uh, after that, I spent a, a short period of time at, at UBS in investment banking. I was there for four years, um, focusing on the financial institutions uh, space. Uh, and then from there went into uh, private equity in what was at the time NatWest Equity Partners, um, it was the equity investment division of NatWest Bank. This was the late 1990s when I joined. Uh, and a short time thereafter, we were bought, well, NatWest was bought out by the Royal Bank of Scotland. And we took the opportunity uh, to go independent. And so we've been independent uh, ever since then, uh, raising funds from uh, our LPs, our investors, are typically pension funds. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, and we're currently investing our sixth uh, independent fund. It's called Bridgepoint Europe 6. Uh, and it happens also to be uh, 6 billion euros uh, in size. Um, just from um, a, a, a practice standpoint, I look after all activities in financial services, but, but I also, in my spare time, uh, spend a lot of time focusing on other sectors. I've spent a lot of time in healthcare um, uh, around Europe. I've been on the board of um, uh, one of the world's largest uh, dialysis clinic networks. I was on the board of uh, a large group of private hospitals in France. 
Um, I've also been involved in sports uh, and in particular, as uh, Chris uh, mentioned, I've been on the board of a company called Dorna Sports, which owns and operates the World Motorcycle Racing Championship, MotoGP, and I've been on that board since 2006 uh, when I led the acquisition of that. Um, so to try and give you a little bit of a, a perspective on um, how private equity works, um, and I think just before I dive into the content on this page, which are the sort of the means by which we create value, I'll just give you a, a hypothetical example of a company um, and just some very simple numbers to give you a, a bit of a picture as to some of these dynamics that, that, that go around. So um, as you will know, we're all competing with some formidable competitors to acquire businesses that we think are attractive, are valuable, and importantly, are going to be more attractive and more valuable tomorrow. And we're very much growth focused uh, investors. Um, so let's take our hypothetical company X, uh, and let's say that today it makes uh, 10 million pounds of profits. Um, and we buy that for 100 million pounds. Um, so nominally, we're, we're, we're applying a 10 times multiple on those earnings that, uh, that the company generates. And we're saying, um, that we're willing to pay 100 million pounds for that company. Uh, and we are going to finance it uh, through a mixture of debt and equity. So debt and what we call leverage is a really core cool part of how private equity generally uh, creates its returns. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we're going to fund it 50-50. So we've got 50 million of uh, equity provided by, let's say in this case, Bridgepoint's funds, uh, and we raise 50 million of debt um, against the cash flows of that company. So we're going to use the profits from the company to pay the interest bill, the annual interest bill on that debt package, um, and hopefully to repay down some of, that, some of that debt. At the same time, we're going to try and grow the profits of that business. And let's say that over a period of three or four years, we managed to increase the profit level of that business from 10 million to 15 million pounds. So we've grown profits by 50% over, let's call it three, four years. We're demonstrating nice double digit growth uh, capability. Um, and we decide to sell. The market is uh, uh, hot, the market is attractive. We've demonstrated some really good growth initiatives with the business um, and we sell it for 200 million pounds. So let's say uh, the market has valued it at about 13 times EBITDA at that point in time. And at the same time, we've paid down some of the debt. So maybe our 50 million of debt has gone down to 20 million. We've managed to pay off 30 million or generate 30 million of cash. Um, so on the face of it, we've got a really nice and attractive looking investment here. Um, nominally in terms of enterprise value terms, we've managed to double the size of the business. But actually when it comes to the equity returns, we've done a lot better than that. So we put 50 million of equity in on day one, and we have sold the business for 200. We've got 20 million of debt in there. And so our 50 million of equity has turned into 180 million of value at the end of that period. So you've seen that we've got probably around what 3.6 times return on the equity that we've put in there. So that is a really good example, I think, and a simple example of how does private equity make its money? How does the equity work? How does the leverage affect your returns? And how does profit, growth, and valuation multiple affect all of these things? And these are precisely the elements that are, that are here on this, on this page. So there are today three principal ways in which we create value, assuming that we're able to buy the kinds of businesses that we want at the beginning, we will then uh, spend an awful lot of time working very closely with that business to help manage it. And in fact, for me, that's the most interesting piece of this. Yes, there's great thrill in, in the competition and in winning a deal and beating your competitors to the finish line. But, but the finish line in this case for me is only the start line. It's the point at which you actually get the entry ticket to get on and do the really interesting work, which is really managing a business, working with the management team of a business and, and driving its growth in the future. So there are a number of ways that we can grow that profit line, take our 10 million of profits up to 15 million of profits over time. That's by growing the top line, absolutely. 
through both organic and, and what we call inorganic um, initiatives. On the organic side, we're thinking about new product uh, strategies, we're thinking about new markets, we're thinking about new initiatives, we're thinking about pricing. Can we, can we charge more for our product? Is it the kind of product that people want to buy? And then, as we say, in one inorganic growth as well, which is through acquisitions. And we're, we use our network, we use our capital capabilities to make acquisitions, to consolidate a sector, to generate uh, real scale through the platform investments that we, uh, that we invest in. And then, of course, that uh, conversion of the top line into profits, into net profits after uh, both your cost of sales and your operating cost structures within the business margin and growth are two things that people look at very closely um, in uh, in a market and when they're looking to buy a business so we're always very focused on uh, on that profit level the profit growth but also the the return the margin that you're getting in terms of profit measured as a percentage of your revenues so that's what took our profits from 10 million to 15 million in the in the course in the life of our theoretical uh, example Leverage. Um, so I touched on it. Uh, we put in um, 50 million of debt and we borrowed money. We used the cash flows of the company to pay down uh, that debt during the life of the investment. Um, and I think it's an important um, factor here because the world has changed quite significantly here. And certainly pre financial crisis of 2008, leverage was very aggressive. Uh, uh, the banks were willing to lend very high multiples of profits uh, and very high percentages of, uh, of the valuations of the company. And I guess what the banks were doing were, was underestimating the real risk that is inherent in corporates. Um, and that's really what led to the credit crunch um, in a simplistic term, but, but that's ultimately what led to the credit crunch back in 2008. Since then, the market is a lot more structured, a lot more sensible, a lot more risk averse, I suppose. And therefore you see much more like 50-50 debt equity ratios. They do look for a good chunk of equity uh, sitting ahead of, uh, ahead of them in the capital structure. Um, uh, and they do look at much more normal multiples of, uh, of EBITDA. So in our case, again, 50 million of debt on a business that's generating 10 million profits. It's about five times. It's about what you see in the market today. And then finally, the the, the entry and the exit multiple. Again, in our case, I, I, I theoretically bought this business for 10 times. Um, I theoretically made it more attractive. I demonstrated its ability to grow. I demonstrated its ability to pay down its debt to, to generate cash. I sold it at a good time in the market and I managed to sell it for 13 times. Now in our case, uh, uh, the three times extra that I got on the, on the profit growth probably represented 45, 50 million pounds of value increase there in my overall trend from 100 million to 200 million, uh, if you go back to our, uh, our case. So here you have on the right, I think a good summary of how these different elements come together to actually generate the return on the equity, which ultimately is the piece that we and our investors measure and measure very carefully and benchmark importantly to other products. And with that, Chris, if I can go to the next page um, uh, and just look at um, what, do we, what do we mean when we're talking about benchmarking? Um, well, we're, 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 we're measured by I suppose, where could our investors put their money if it wasn't in us? And nominally, of course, that would be the quoted markets. Um, and of course, you have to look at these uh, markets on a regional basis. I think this is an incredibly interesting graph on many, in many respects. Uh, you'll see that the red columns are the buyout funds. Um, and this is measured over the very long, uh, long term. So from you know one year of very short term but out to 20 years and i think you can see on on pretty much all the measures apart from in europe in in one year and five year horizons and and i'll talk about that uh, a big about so uh, uh, on all measures you can see that the buyout funds have uh, outperformed uh, the quoted markets in every respect and i think it's really important because um actually in reality private equity is not about generating short-term returns. We're not about generating 100% IRR in one year. 
because the nature of our investors is that they are typically pension funds, uh, possibly life insurance companies. They have long-term liabilities uh, and they have long-term uh, interests in um, investing capital. So we'll probably talk about the structure of a private equity fund in due course. They're typically 10-year funds. They can be extended out to 12 years. These are long-term investments that we're talking about. Case in point, MotoGP, as we were talking about, we've been there for 15 years now for all the right reasons. It's not that we found ourselves stuck in there by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it's, uh, it's We're there because we see there to be continued growth potential. But I think this is a really interesting graph because in all time horizons and across all geographies, private equity has demonstrated itself to outperform the public, the public markets. And that is an important point because we charge fees for that. Uh, and we will talk about that in, in due course as well. Uh, William, we have a question. Yes. Uh, not quite sure how else to do questions. Um, I, it, it says anonymous attendee, but I don't know whether that's the anonymous attendee would like to ask their own question, but that's down to Daniel, whether they know who to... Can you do that, Daniel? No, I'm afraid I can't if they've chosen to be anonymous. Oh, okay, right, they're doing to be in on the trouble. Anyway, um, the question is, how important is restructuring a company or the corporate governance for private equity in generating profit? Oh, right. Well, really, I'm sorry, you were drawing breath and about to answer. And I jumped in because I'm going to talk about the corporate governance bit. I don't know whether you want to talk about the restructuring bit. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to the corporate. Yeah, I mean, just I'll, I'll touch on it very briefly um, because we do come and talk to these points in, in due course. Um, but I think the um, a really fundamental part of how private equity operates is that the the governance and, and the and the structure of a business, the reporting lines, the relationship between us and the corporate, between us as executives and the executive team of a business, and how we interact through the board, through day-to-day -day interactions through our shareholder rights, of course, is really fundamentally important. We have to have the structures right so that then we can be agile, responsive, we can move quickly, we can take control when we need to, but importantly, we're in a good place to support management teams when they, when they need our help and our support. So it's a fundamental piece of, of how we go about um, you know, evaluating and assessing the businesses that we're able to support. I think all of the um, structuring around the nature of our relationship and the nature of our working relationship with a portfolio company is absolutely fundamental. Without that, um, it would be very hard for us to, uh, to exert our control and our influence over those companies. Um, we'll probably go into more detail on that in due course, but, but I think it's absolutely integral to, to what we do and how we operate. Yeah, thank you. Now, on corporate, you touch in corporate governance on a vital point. You might wonder, well, what's the magic source in private equity? How does it actually um, ensure a company uh, grows? Um, what, what does it do with a company that is so effective? Well, one of the key reasons in my view um, uh, that private equity has been so successful as the sh chart in front of you shows. And I should add that there's quite a lot of academic research on the subject of returns and not all of it shows what's on the chart. Some of it shows that private equity has based on certain measures uh, only um, matched what you uh, see by way of returns from the public markets. The majority show what's on the slide. The difficulty is comparing apples with apples. Um, and there are all sorts of ways to try to do that, but not all of them are very effective. The data sets anyway are relatively limited. But I think most would agree that private equity has outperformed mar uh, public markets. Um, and one of the key reasons, as I say, I think is the governance structures. So buyouts are characteristics, as William was suggesting, by private equity uh, investors um, focusing hard, active monitoring by them, providing financial oversight and imposing financial disciplines as well as strategic input uh, on those actually running the companies. And we'll talk about the management piece a little later in the, uh, the lecture. Some say that the discipline imposed by debt having to ensure that a company operates and develops in such a way as to comply with a range of covenants imposed in the debt documents may help as well. 
Uh, both UK and US evidence, though, shows that the most important uh, governance characteristic is something we're going to come on to talk about in a bit of detail and explain to you, which is the management equity stake. Private equity is all about alignment. Hold that concept because we're going to talk about it in a number of concepts. There's much more complete alignment of interest between a private equity fund manager and the senior executives that they back to run companies than you will find in a listed company environment. And that, uh, I think, is one of the key ingredients why the return slide in front of you is as it is. Um, uh, what private equity governance does in perhaps more academic terms is deal more effectively with the agency problems that are much debated in the public company context, uh, less so in the private equity context, but written about uh, interestingly by my colleague in that book that I referred to uh, earlier. So in the, uh, the, the agency difficulties were highlighted in some public companies at the end of the 90s and the beginning of this century. Think of Enron, WorldCom, Hollinger and Parmalide. There aren't private equity equivalents of that and I can't see there ever being private equity equivalents of that. Um, all this was encapsulated quite well by a Cambridge lecture given by Paul Miners, who was the city minister in the last Labour government and actually um, uh, a fund manager himself for many years. In fact, he was a colleague of Williams when Gartmore, the firm that he ran, a public company investor, was a sister company of what is now Bridgepoint in the Nat West stable. He yeah, probably dealt with him, William. Uh, I have a few times, um, uh, an engaging and interesting man. Yes, indeed. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, in this Cambridge lecture, overly diversified portfolios with a significant number of underweight holdings, and we're talking here about public company fund managers, means there is little economic incentive for the fund manager, the public company fund manager, individually or organisationally, to adopt the mindset of an owner and behave accordingly. If there is any sense of ownership, it applies to a portfolio as a whole and how individual securities interact to affect risk relative to benchmark. There is little focus on ownership responsibility towards individual companies. We thus have a critical vacuum in public company governance. No one actually takes on the responsibility of ownership. For the past, past year, I've been chairing an unlisted company financed by private equity. I've been struck by the extent to which this ownership model leads to strong and effective governance focused on the aligned, that word again, interest of owners and management. All are working to a common agenda with shareholders fully engaged on strategic issues and in receipt of timely and complete management information going well beyond financial reporting. Contrast this with the situation for a public limited company where shareholder engagement on strategy is almost non-existent, reactive at best, and reporting is formulaic and limited in its interactivity. So, private equity produces, sorry, Louise, it sounds like there's another question. Just going, well, Ed, we have two more questions. I was going to suggest we, we left them for a bit because I know at least one, which is about exit. You know, I think somebody will be talking about, will one of you talk about exit in a minute? Uh, yes yes so yeah. maybe we'll hold that one and the other one is about the other one is about how lawyers break into the private equity industry and i don't know if you want to take that now or take that later on when you'll come on to the parts lawyers play um well lawyers break into the private equity industry as lawyers focusing on that area by working at firms like travis smith that have big practices uh, in that world um, if they want to actually join a private equity house like Bridgepoint, William, you'd better explain where you recruit from and how you join private equity and whether being a lawyer is a good route in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess um, I, I guess there are, you know, within a private equity house, I mean, there are a whole number of different uh, roles and functions that we have. And, you know, as you will all be aware, um, you know, the legal uh, sort of in-house legal functions in private equity houses are 
uh, ever greater on a day-by-day -day basis, um, in part because of regulation, um, in large part because we're dealing with ever more uh, investors on a, on a global basis. And then finally, for a great reason, which is because we're growing and we're, we're growing the number of products and the breadth of products that we're offering to our uh, investors. And therefore, actually, from, from a legal standpoint, there's a huge amount to do in-house within a private equity firm, whether that's from a, you know, from a, from a, from a compliance, from a fund uh, uh, law standpoint, et cetera. I think from an executive side um, of things, it's probably a little bit less common, but uh, the typical areas that we would recruit from for sort of the executive teams uh, would be from consulting, investment banking, and on occasion, indeed, from, from the legal profession. Um, but in all of these cases, we would normally uh, be taking people in once they'd had a, a good chunk of sort of professional experience. So we wouldn't normally take at any level across the business sort of direct graduate um, intakes. We would normally expect people to, to, to have done a few years, probably two to three to four years of uh, professional experience beforehand. Okay, we have one more question, um, which maybe um, Gabriel, I'd actually like to ask it now, and then William or Chris think they're going to deal with it later, I can say that. Can you make Gabriel a, whatever you need to make him, Daniel? Is that possible? He's on his way. That's brilliant. Here he comes. Gabriel, when you're, can you ask your question? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof, for the for the opportunity. So, I just wanted to to get the thoughts of, of Chris and William on whether. So, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely fine. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks. So, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on what what the most important considerations are for for a fund when deciding to to leave, you know, to pull out. Uh, or take away their investment from a portfolio. Um, is the most important consideration minimizing risk or, or are there other more important uh, considerations? Thank you. There's probably one for you, William. Yeah, sure. Um, so great question, Gabriel, because um, uh, it's a very, very finely balanced and a very nuanced um, question in reality because it, uh, to start with, I suppose it depends on what sort of uh, private equity house you are. So, you know, there are a whole bunch of different strategies that um, that you know come in under the umbrella of private equity. Whether that's venture capital, whether that's growth capital, whether that's leverage buyouts, as as we focus on, or indeed, you know, there are distressed investors that uh, that look at the world in a, in a different and very opportunistic way. And so everybody will have their own way of interpreting this. I think from speaking from, from our standpoint, so from a growth oriented leverage buyout house, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex mix of what's the market like? Is the market opportunity there? How has the company performed? Do you think that you would get um, a good answer, a good solution for the company at that point in time, both in terms of the absolute valuation and the return that you would get on your money. Um, is it the right partner? Is it the right route? Is it the right answer for the portfolio company and the, and the management team? Are you selling to another VC? Are you selling to, are you floating it, for example? Is there a stock market listing? Um, and also, what's the what's the opportunity? You know, do you think you could go for more? Because we, as a fund, are measured, and as as and as mentioned before, we measure ourselves on absolute money multiples. So we do have flexibility to wait for a couple of years if we think that makes the difference between, you know, getting two times on our money and maybe three times on our money, or actually, if it makes the difference from you know, a company that hasn't done terribly well and we need to give it a little bit more time so that we get it back into profit again um, and try and recover some of our investment in a case of one that hasn't worked so well. So it's a really finely balanced um, topic. It's a really, really good question because there's a lot of art that goes into it. And if I may admit as well, a little bit of luck. Um, sometimes you just get the right people coming at the right time 
saying the right things. Um, and you have to be opportunistic and able to take those opportunities when they come to. I'd rather be lucky than clever in many, many respects. Um, but you do have to you do have to have a mix of of all of the above to 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 time it right. And sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't quite. Um, we all have uh, opportunities that we should have been in, but um, but on the whole, we try and get it right more often than not. Uh, thank you, William. We do actually have two more questions now. Um, if you don't mind, do you mind taking them now? Because I hope this isn't going to mess up your time, but that will be really good. A very a COVID-related sure. question and 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 another question. So if that's okay, we'll we'll take this. Um, Yamuna, can you make Yamuna a, a, a powerless piece? Thank you. Sorry. Bit of tech. Is that going to work, Daniel? Or oh yes, here we are. Here she is. Good. Do ask your question, Yamuna. Yeah. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Yamuna. Hi. Uh, so my question was related to the kind of loans that uh, private equity firms have access to these days. So under the COVID support, uh, there was recent discussions that even though there are dry powder, they were able to access the uh, COVID support state backed uh, loans, which are much cheaper. So my question was related to how this could, uh, this could have challenges in the future when the private equity firms have to possibly deal with more expensive re refinancing because these cheap loans are not going to be available for a longer time. So I wanted to understand whether private equity firms are concerned about it. Well, perhaps I can answer first before I pass over to William. Um, uh, to begin with, private equity houses, uh, portfolio companies weren't able to access uh, the various support schemes the government put in place uh, a bit over uh, uh, 11 months ago, was it 10 months ago? Uh, that's because the private equity portfolio companies under the then rules were all aggregated together and that took them outside the criteria that made them eligible. Now the rules were changed but as far as I know not very many private equity companies have taken advantage of uh, the government-backed um, loan uh, schemes that are available. Uh, I, I don't know whether any of the Bridgepoint companies have, and you could put a gloss on that, uh, William. Yeah, absolutely. And and without getting too specific in terms of individual uh, companies and, and what they've done. Um, but um, I mean, I think it, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, question because um, I guess from a from a financing standpoint, we're always thinking about what's the best way to finance our portfolio companies and where is there uh, low cost financing to be found. Now, having said that, I think there, um, there is a, probably a slightly different, if you look at this from a Daily Mail standpoint, so there's a slightly different moral lens, I suppose, on a business that is uh, taking on government support when in the background there is a very well-funded equity owner um, that potentially could put money in itself and i think as an industry we're very sensitive to you know how does it not only is it the right thing to do but does it look like the right thing to do and therefore actually in in many respects uh, we've been very cautious about um, taking on um, COVID support unless it's essential for uh, any specific company. Uh, and actually, you will also have seen lots of commentary that, you know, many businesses have uh, thought about proactively repaying uh, that COVID support as well, to the extent that um, you know, certainly supermarkets, for example, have had excess profits, then, you know, many of those have uh, sought to repay those funds in advance. So I think there's, a, there's an important um, it's a responsible investors piece that sits on top of that, which is not only technically can you, but actually ought you to. Um, and that's, a, that's an important um, consideration, qualitative consideration that um, is, uh, is right at the forefront of PE Mind uh, at this time. Thank you very much. And thank you for a great question, Yumuna. We have one more question that's popped up as well. And this is a sort of follow up to what um, 
one of you, Chris, I think said. So maybe we can bring Kenneth in now with his question. Hi everyone. <clears throat> um, thank you, um, Chris. Um, you you said that P funds have, or P backed companies have outperformed quoted companies, and I think, uh, and you said that's primarily because of the governance structures. I think that that, that better governance is largely due to the information and content rights given to um, the sponsor funds, and that enables them to participate actively in, in, in monitoring the company. But my worry is, um, doesn't that come with the risk of shadow director liability? Um, is, this, is this a common risk in the market? And if it is, how, 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 has, it, how has it been dealt with over the years? Well, uh, I mean, it's a good point, uh, but what typically happens in the governance structures of um, private equity backed companies is that the board um, uh, comprises uh, uh, normally two executives from the private equity house. Um, uh, so William will be on the board of uh, Dorna that looks after MotoGP um, and it's usually I think in, in, in this would be true of you William those who worked on the deal before it was consummated who then stay with the company through the life of the investment all the way through uh, to an exit, whether it's a sale or um, an IPO or, or whatever. Um, and therefore, um, the shadow director point doesn't really often come into play because um, the key individuals who are monitoring the investment um, and helping take decisions relating to it are actually on the board already. Um, I mean, there are occasionally question marks over observers because private equity houses sometimes, or certainly they used to, take observer rights. And observers do have to be very careful about what they do in participating in key decisions and influencing them. Uh, but by and large, um, the key decisions are taken by those who are already directors. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So, um... So in my case, for example, I would be an actual director on the boards of, of my portfolio companies in any event. And as Chris says, um, you know, that will largely come because I will have led the deal, built the relationship with the team over a long period of time. And therefore, it's sort of an extension of the acquisition work and the due diligence that you've done. It's also the case that, um, I mean, I've gone on to the board of, of many of our portfolio companies, but, but in all cases, um, Kenneth, I would say, as an actual director, and therefore, whilst you know the point is is there, and we're always conscious of it, um, we do take that you know we take it head on. Uh, in a sense, we we take that risk head on by actually being on the board, uh, and that's that's really the best way for us to be able to exert our our influence in the way that we think is is best for the company, and be able to do it in as direct a way as possible without being worried about you know, potential knock-on consequences of that other than those which come from you acting as a director of the company. Um, sorry. Yes, I, I think, oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. Now, the next question is, I'm sure we're just about to come to, um, Rohika, so perhaps you could just hang on and then you can follow up with something else if, if, if they haven't covered all your, your points. I think we need to, to move on a little bit now. Um, okay, it. thank you. Um, so, uh, what is the effect of this private equity uh, outperformance? Well, the effect has been that um, more and more money has been placed with it, and we'll, William will talk in a second about who is placing that money uh, with private equity houses to manage. And this slide taken from another data provider statistics, Prequin, shows what has happened over the last 20 years to private equity funds under management. They've grown from 577 billion at the end of December 2000 to four and three quarter trillion in June 2020, a huge growth. And the predictions are um, by many in the market, in the industry, that that 4.7, uh, well, four or five trillion dollars uh, is gonna uh, continue to mushroom and uh, may, this is what Prequin predict, grow to nine billion dollars by the end of 2025. Outperformance is the, the principal reason why 
the investors that we're going to come on to describe, or William is, put money to work with private equity houses. Um, and it's had knock-on effects on the public markets. I'm not going to touch very much on this. If you're attending the roundtable tomorrow, um, William and I are speaking at it. Um, we are going to examine this particular issue, the private equity versus public company contrast, uh, in more detail. But what has been happening at the same time as private equity is growing is that the number of listed companies in the UK and the UK, US have been actually shrinking quite dramatically. Uh, in the US, the data shows that from a peak in 1996, the number of listed companies in the US has shrunk by about half. In the UK, the numbers aren't quite as stark as that, but they're approaching it. And um, a principal reason, uh, I think, is that private equity is there to provide capital uh, as an alternative to the capital that used to be the sole um, recourse for those founders wanting to exit or those company owners that were private wanting to raise money to expand and develop their, their companies. So it's not coincident a coincidence that private equity has grown and the number of listed companies have shrunk. Um, I mean, it's true to say that um, uh, th the market capitalization of public markets uh, has actually grown a little bit, although only uh, in line with uh, GDP. Um, uh, uh, and the re net result is that those remaining listed companies are, are bigger than they used to be. Um, some, uh, there's a big SPAC trend at the moment that you've probably read about. Um, uh, I see that as a, a, a fashion rather than a, a long-term trend, but we will see. And at the end of the lecture, if we want to uh, talk a little more about SPACs, both William and I can give our views on uh, why we think they're more likely to be a passing fad than something enduring. Now, what we're planning to do now is to move on to get under the bonnet of how private equity works, first of all at the fund level and then at the transaction level. So we've been talking a lot about private equity houses. We probably ought to just reflect on what is a private equity house. Well, a private equity house, as you will probably have picked up from what we are saying, is uh, an asset manager, essentially. Um, uh, very much the minority are listed, such as 3i. So if you want uh, exposure as a retail investor to private equity, you will have to hunt around for the few listed companies that are essentially private equity houses to, put, uh, to buy some shares. And 3i is uh, in the UK, the biggest of those. Um, it invests its balance sheet money. Uh, there are some like HG, which are also listed, but they uh, uh, do what the majority do as well and invest their own money along with what others do uh, together. And what others do in the main is raising independent funds from outside investors and whose money they manage. Funds, and we'll uh, e examine the way funds are put together in a little bit, are structured as limited partnerships. Um, uh, I could ask you why that is. Um, if anybody quickly wants to uh, raise a hand or uh, uh, um, deposit an answer that for the two main reasons, do do so now. If not, I'll go on to explain it. Well, the two main reasons are be because um, um, uh, limited partnerships are tax transparent so the investors uh, don't lose money at uh, the intermediate fund level uh, to the tax uh, man. Uh, and the other and the other is that um, uh, uh, they confer limited liability on the investors. Uh, limited partnerships are um, English and Scottish creatures and equivalents have been set up 
elsewhere, but that is the invariable form of corporate structure that a fund will take. And as we'll explain, and as William has mentioned, funds have a limited life. One important thing to note is that funds are illiquid, so investors in them can't ask for their money back during the life of the fund, in contrast to those investing in hedge funds. And there will not be borrowings other than for smoothing purposes uh, at uh, the fund level. Um, uh, the vast majority of private equity executives like William are also different to those working in the hedge fund world. Um, so they will be uh, individuals um, originating deals as William did with uh, Dorna. Uh, once a deal is found, they'll be trying to complete it. That's the execution phase. Then when they've invested in the company, they'll maintain close contact with it participating as William does with that company actively in board meetings and participating in key strategic decisions. And finally, they'll try to sell their investment for a substantial profit. Hedge fund uh, managers, by contrast, will typically be more remote individuals looking at share prices on computer screens, analyzing research and issuing buy and sell orders remotely. So a very different type of uh, fund manager to those in the uh, the private equity industry. Now, I'll hand over to William to talk about who it is that actually invests in these private equity funds. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Um, and in this, I'll pick up on that question, which is, um, how do you go about raising funds to, to form a private equity fund? Um, but um, in essence, um, you know, and put very simply, uh, typical investors in, in private equity are pension funds and insurance companies. Um, and I mentioned before, the, the main reason for this is because these are investors, one, that have significant amounts of funds to invest uh, across different asset classes. And we'll talk about uh, the allocation uh, amongst those asset classes to private equity. Um, but two, because they have very long term balance sheets that they're, ma they're, that they're managing. So a pension fund uh, starts its calculations, I suppose, by looking at the long term liabilities that it has and maps those against the asset base that it has. And of course, tries to match that asset base and its investment profile with those long term payment obligations that it needs to make to its pension fund beneficiaries over the long term. And therefore, um, private equity is an interesting asset class for them because by definition, it is a long term asset class. It's pension, uh, a big pun, the, the fund lives are typically 10 to 12 years. Um, and uh, what they are looking at is generating significant multiples uh, of their investment uh, uh, over a number of years. So philosophically and from an asset and liability management uh, standpoint, private equity is a very, very attractive product for the pension funds and, uh, and certainly the life insurance companies that are managing long-term balance sheets. Um, I think the interesting piece here is also, um, and these are, these are actually from, from Bridgepoint, so just representative of kind of some of the compositions of our funds, um, just on that sort of who they are and what, they're, what they look like. Um, is on the right there, and you can see, you know, the vast majority is the the dark grey piece, the public pension funds. Um, but then, if you add into that the corporate pension funds, you've got the endowment foundations and sovereign entities. All of these are very long term investors. Uh, at the end of the day, then you add into the insurance companies, and actually, everything barring asset managers and banks uh, would fall precisely into those sort of categories that uh, that I've talked about before. I think the other interesting piece is just looking at the geographic split here. The vast majority, 55 to 60 percent of the funds currently come from the North America. Um, and, and we'll touch on that again just in a moment on the next slide. Um, but then with a relatively balanced split, I suppose, from, 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 the, rest of the, from the rest of the world, barring the Middle East. Um, so this is a good, a good um, sample. And our funds don't look that different to any of our competitors, whether that's CVC or Sinven or, or any of the American funds, uh, certainly here in Europe. Um, if we can go on to the next 
page though, I think I'll just like to touch on uh, on sort of asset allocations because this is an important point and, and an important driver behind um, why the industry has, has grown. Um, so we've got the factor that, uh, as we've demonstrated, private equity can be demonstrated, I'll, I'll say it specifically like that, can be demonstrated to generate superior returns compared to other markets, but notably the public markets. And in that I would say, and with a different volatility, a lower volatility and a lower risk profile than the public markets. So I would argue a better return over the very long term. Uh, and it matches pension funds fundamental needs of um, being able to deploy capital for the long term and generate uh, significant multiples of money. And as a result of that, um, what the pension funds have been doing is to a large degree decorrelating their own investment portfolio performance from the public markets and allocating ever increasing sums to alternative investments and in particular private equity. So as you can see, it's a little bit of a detailed graph, but I'll just pick out one or two uh, data points here for you. Um, if you look at North America as the largest investor in private equity representative of our uh, chart, the page before, um, uh, I, you will see that in the light blue boxes, the current allocation uh, of their asset base to private equity is 6.1%. But what you're seeing, if you look at the, the gold boxes, their target allocation is 10%. So if you're looking at um, uh, these sums here um, in terms of today's allocation versus tomorrow's anticipated allocation, and you see from a couple of pages before just how quickly the total funds under management in the private equity space has grown over the last 10 to 20 years, um, I'm convinced that you will see this continue to uh, extend um, and continue to grow in the medium term. So you'll look at um, the UK is probably a little bit behind that and Europe is a little bit behind that, but they're probably at the 4%, but looking to take that to 5%. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a 25% increase if you think about it that way. 6% to 10% obviously in North America is gonna continue to drive growth quite substantially. Australia is an interesting uh, piece, obviously three and a half to six, but Asia, um, uh, if you look at that, you know, 3% going to 8%. So lots of growth in funds, potential funds to deploy uh, from around the, around the globe. If we just take on to the next page um, there, Chris, thank you. So um, just looking at a topic we've just mentioned on, on one or two occasions, the life cycle of a, of a fund. Um, as mentioned, these are uh, typically 10 year limited life funds. They are they typically built with uh, uh, an ability to extend by up to two years, um, purely to provide a little bit of leeway in order to allow the manager to tidy up the fund at the end of its life and ensure that uh, it can be neatly packaged up and, uh, and liquidated at the end with all of the investments having been uh, exited. It's much more of a nuisance if you have 150 investors and you've got 10 uh, investments in your fund and you have to distribute out the individual holdings in each of those businesses to the, each individual shareholder at the end of the fund because you haven't had the time to liquidate it, you can understand that it would be much easier just to extend it by a couple of years and, and, and look to uh, generate an orderly exit from any remaining investors investments that you have. But the typical life cycle of a fund, I think this demonstrates it very well, is if you're looking to manage it over a 10 year period, you're looking to deploy the capital in the first three to four years. You will then in those first three to four years start to have a few ass assets that start to exit. Maybe you'll have a couple of refinancings. You'll start to get some capital coming back, flowing back from those assets. You'll start to distribute that capital back to investors. If there are still drawdowns to be made, you may net the two off. And then as you start to mature the portfolio, that will then start to cross the, uh, the J curve into the profit level. You'll have returned all the capital that you've drawn down. And that's when you start getting into the profit levels uh, on the fund as a whole. A um, couple of points to mention here. Uh, the bottom of this curve, which here is shown as the five year mark, may or may not be the full amount of the fund that you've raised. So in the context of our fund, let me give you an example 
Um, in Bridgepoint, our current fund is 6 billion euros. Um, two things will affect that. First of all, uh, we would normally hold back somewhere between 5 and 10% of that fund amount in order to provide follow-on support for our portfolio companies, whether that's for refinancings, whether that's for acquisitions, whether that's other capital support that you need to provide those companies with. So you want to hold a little bit of firepower back so you don't get caught short at the tail end of the fund. And secondly, some of those capital returns that I've talked about, which may uh, net off drawdowns, uh, may mean that actually we never actually draw down the full amount of the 6 billion or indeed 5.4 billion if you were to say we're holding 10% back. Maybe if we're managing to uh, manage our portfolio very well, we'd actually start to fund some of those future drawdowns actually from profits generated from inside inside the fund as well. So all of those factors are part of um, you know, the, the art of portfolio management that we were referring to earlier on. Um, that um, you know balances out all of these considerations that you need to take, uh, not only for the individual asset and the specific circumstances of an asset, but also its position within the fund as a whole. And and we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, the return that that fund is generating and what curve we're demonstrating to our investors. The last thing I'd like to say is just if you take this as a snapshot of one fund, the private equity model is to be able to do this and then repeat it. So repeat it after three years, repeat it after three years, repeat it after three years. And if your first fund is 3 billion euros, your second fund is 4 billion euros, your third fund is 5 billion euros, you can see how the, that starts to snowball. You start to get real growth. You start to get a very efficient model because ultimately I think one of the, one of the attraction of of private equity is that uh, you can deploy capital with a relatively limited uh, resource base. We have a very strongly outsourced model. Um, and the more efficient you can be, the more funds you can manage. And then we'll talk about the fee structures and so on. But the more fees flow into the into the GP, into the manager on the one hand, and the more carry that can be is, can be capable of being generated uh, for the executives over the very long term. I just asked something, William, before yeah. we leave the slide. I mean, <clears throat> what you've got is your 10 year fund, but obviously the fundraising bit at the, at the, at the beginning is that that's presumably not on the 10 year plan. That would be beforehand. Is, is that Correct. How does that take? I mean, how, what, what, how long would you, or a typical fund take to raise before you get into the 2013 bit? Correct. So, um, I mean, our investor relations team would say they are always fundraising. They're always out on the road, maintaining relationships, et cetera. But in reality, um, I would say um, it's variable. The very best funds, uh, you know, the real best in class, the actual fundraising period may be quite concentrated, maybe three to six months, but the preparation that will have gone into it will be huge. And therefore those three months will start when they've already hit the ground running in a sense. Uh, so they could have spent a good year, a year and a half preparing for that. And there may be lots of soft conversations happening in advance. So it's a little bit variable, but I would say a year of preparation and a year of fundraising is probably not a bad, not a bad way to think about it. Um, you've also got to pick your moment in the market. You know, what are market conditions like? What other competitors are out there looking to raise funds at the same time? So again, back to this sort of construction and the art of timing. Uh, it's a really, really important part. So, so I think it's, it is, it is um, one of the key factors of private equity, though, and I think this plays to a lot of aspects that you will cover in, in your courses, that um, you generate efficiency by having a great investor relations machine, let's say, and the more funds that you can use that machine to raise, the more efficient you are as a business. But the same applies, for example, for the legal support and the compliance, et cetera. So the more you can utilize that across different funds and across different products, then the more efficient you're becoming as an asset management business um, beyond just the pure uh, private equity manager in, in individual assets. So there's a lot of complexity that goes into, into it, but, um, but, a, but a great source of competitive advantage and efficiency uh, within all of us as, as managers. Okay. So um, in all of that, I think um, 
uh, and back to the opening definition of of what is a private equity house. Um, I mean, one of one thing that we are always transparent about and always very clear about, um, and very important to do so to to ensure everybody's got alignment, is that it's all about the exit. At the end of the day, um, this is all about returning capital to our investors um, and looking to generate the very best possible capital gain for them within a, a determined period of time. Um, um, we measure ourselves on a money multiple basis. Um, so uh, uh, we are looking at least to double the value of our capital um, over a three, four, five year period in, in, in an individual asset. We're looking really to be able to treble that. Um, if you measure that in an IRR basis, that's as, as mentioned here, 20 to 25, possibly 30% IRR. But we're also looking to replicate that across all of our assets so that we're uh, able to double the value of our fund as a whole, uh, which is really what we're seeking to do. Um, again, depending on the strategy, um, different houses will have different returns targets. We see we see ourselves as being very consistent um, and very uh, predictable in terms of the way that we deliver those returns. So we're trying to present a relatively low risk profile to our investors. But if you were to think about some of the VC houses, some of the growth capital houses, some of the startup funds, they will obviously be investing in much higher risk businesses, um, many of which will fail. And therefore the ones that uh, do succeed need to have higher return potential in order to be able to compensate for the higher number of failures that they would have. So different funds will have different views on returns. Um, you know, a 20%, 25% IRR will, will sound like very little on an individual asset basis for a, uh, a startup house, for example. Um, but at the same time, as I've mentioned before, we're not looking to generate 100% IRR in a year because that will feel like a very flash in the pan, opportunistic sort of um, return rather than a repeatable, consistent return that we can generate year after year after year after year. So I think it's important to bear that in mind. There are horses for courses in this. Um, but uh, but that's why we pitch ourselves. And I think the last point, point to mention is just how long we aim to do this. Um, Dawner always comes up as an example of this because, because we've been in for so long, but the reality is that typically you would want to be in for four to five, maybe to six years. Hold periods have extended a little bit in recent years as you know the market's been more difficult and the economic environment is that much more challenging to drive growth and drive returns. But, but our returns expectations haven't changed. And then finally, just to um, comment on, so how do the economics work um, in all of this? Um, uh, this the, the sort of the catchphrase for this is, is known as two and 20. Um, so uh, you've got a management fee structure that the GP, um, uh, receives on the committed capital in the fund. Um, that's typically in the range of one and a half to two percent. Um, and then you have um, sort of the profit share. The, the incentive comes from uh, the participation in the surplus profits of a fund as a whole. Now that's, that's known as the carried interest or the carry. Um, and that is uh, shared out amongst the executives of the, of the fund uh, on occasion in certain houses, there will be a corporate component to that. So part of that may go to the GP itself, um, but that's a large part of the incentive here for people to be involved in private equity. I think the interesting bit there is um, the back to Chris's point at the beginning of alignment. This system uh, is incredibly effective at creating alignment between uh, the private equity house and its investors. The management fee is generally structured to cover the costs of the uh, of the GP, so its office network, its salaries and bonuses for its executives, its due diligence costs, its network costs, let's say, in terms of running itself as a business, um, and the and the profit incentive only kicks in once investors have reached a minimum return known as a hurdle, uh, which may be six or seven or eight percent. Uh, as a whole across the value of the of the whole fund on an IRR basis. Once the fund starts to um, uh, uh, surpass those levels, 
then the profits are shared between the investors and the executives um, on a pro rata basis. Um, and that's when, um, you know, obviously the, the model can be incredibly remunerative for individuals and for the private equity houses themselves. At the same time, um, there's further alignment generated because both the GP and the uh, executives do invest directly alongside the investors in the fund and in the deals uh, that they do through the co-investment schemes. You could look at that, we would call that um, similar to an institutional investment, so it would generate the same returns in its own right as uh, as the investors would receive. Um, but um, but the real upside potential, I suppose, comes through the profit share, uh, which the executive participate in. Um, I think the last point to mention is there are um, different houses with different structures. So we operate on a fund as a whole basis. So all of the executives participate in the same fund. So whether Sweden has a particularly brilliant deal or Spain has a period of five years where it's really difficult to get deals done because of the economic environment, uh, we all gain and share and um, and benefit from performance of the business as a whole. So I'm as incentivized to help our Spanish team do a deal as they are uh, to help the Paris team uh, do a deal. Other houses may have deal by deal structures. CVC notably uh, is, a, is a big proponent of this where actually uh, the carry is shared on a deal by deal basis in the executive team involved in that deal. Um, and, then a, and then a component goes back to the corporate as well. That gives more of a hunter killer atmosphere, I suppose, about uh, around the deal team. It incentivizes slightly different behavior. It makes them an incredibly successful house. Um, but at the same time, I would say culturally, it just it leads the business in a slightly different direction to how we've always operated as Bridgepoint, which is one fund uh, across all of our network as a whole. Um, William, so, yes, sorry. sorry. Okay, we have we have a question that is all about investors, so it might be a good thing to answer now. Um, Daniel, might you be able to um, promote Gabriel again to a panelist so he can ask his question? Because this is to do with investors before we get on to. Um, anything about investment. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I indeed. Thanks, Gabriel. Okay, yeah. So this, thanks, thanks, William and Chris. Um, it's been a very interesting um, session. So I was, was just wondering, um, I don't know if this question makes sense, but because of the, the debt elements that are involved um, in all of this, um, it's, you know, in a private equity deal. And, and because we have here uh, institutional investors who are holding, um, you, you know, because of the size of the funds that they hold and the systemic risks that this can cause, I'm just wondering how, they, how you know, risk is dealt with. You know, how, 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 how is it hedged against? Uh, you know, is it possible to have maybe derivatives contracts or some other form of hedging? I, I understand that you know the, that PE funds diversify their portfolio, you know, to deal with risk and all of that. But I'm just wondering whether it's possible, you know, to have a more efficient way of hedging against the risk of failure by portfolio companies. Chris, shall I, shall I answer in generic terms first, and then uh, if you'd like to come in with a more technical uh, response to that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and Gabriel, I think it's, a, it's an excellent question because ultimately, you know, private equity is all about balancing risk and return. And it's about uh, offering investors the right profile of risk and return that they're looking for. So um, I think the first, the first two answers I would, I would give um, on that is, one, um, they or the investors are hedged through two, let's say, non-technical structures. One, the fact that uh, it's a fund as a whole uh, that they're investing in. And two um, is actually on the capacity of the manager, so us as a GP, to manage and control the risks within our portfolio. Now, I think on a, on a, on a technical basis, all of our investments are structured as individual standalone structures and we raise the debt on a company by company basis in order precisely to ring fence 
uh, any potential can contamination. If one company were to fail, you don't want that to affect your fund as a whole. And therefore, in a sense, the, the protection that you're providing is you're trying to build a diverse, in our case, we're trying to build a diversified fund for our investors. Uh, and therefore the loss that uh, would affect investors comes through, um, you know, the real loss is if we've lost the money as a whole across our fund. We are trying to give them a, a level of predictable returns given a balanced portfolio that we are actively managing in a very, very hands-on and dare I say activist sort of way um, in order to prevent losses from happening and in order to minimize, absolutely minimize the number of losses that can take place within our fund as a whole. Within individual companies, they will always be structured on a basis that we think is sustainable, that we think is very unlikely to lead to loss, even if, of course, you know, stuff happens in the world and companies may or may not perform to, uh, to the uh, expectations that we had at the, at the time of investment. So, you know, defaults do happen within PE companies. Um, and you'll have seen some of those certainly in the last uh, 12 months as a result of COVID. Very hard to have predicted something like COVID uh, only 12 months ago. Now, having said that, you'll also see that the number of failures has been very, very limited indeed, actually, within uh, within, uh, within private equity portfolios. And you can probably list the number of failures on one, if not two hands um, uh, in that time. So I think the fact of investing, one, through a fund structure, funds as a whole structure, and two, by investing in trusted, uh, well-known, reputable private equity brands. I think that's where the investors are getting their hedging from, their protection from, rather than actually looking to hedge individual assets through structured products any individual way. Chris, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah. And the uh, only thing that. I would... Uh, yeah, the, the only things I would add to it is that I, I think it's very difficult to see systemic risk in private equity in contrast to hedge funds. And uh, the reason for that is uh, because of a point I made much earlier, which is that uh, investing in a private equity fund is illiquid. You can't ask for your money back. You can't uh, therefore cause a sort of run on the bank in the way that has sometimes happened in the hedge fund world, causing widespread destruction um, to those around that uh, hedge fund. And as William says, uh, uh, private equity houses invest in each company as a silo. Uh, one failing doesn't immediately knock over into uh, another company. It doesn't have any effect on it at all. Um, now, uh, the, the, the only qualification I would uh, put on that is that there are some bits of legislation that are creeping in that are effectively piercing uh, the corporate veil and may qualify an element of what I just said. You can see that in bits of uh, pension legislation, in bits of environmental legislation, in bits of some other legislation that's been uh, uh, suggested. But none of that so far has had any dramatic effect on private equity houses or caused financial problems uh, for them. So um, uh, I don't see uh, the systemic risk issue as being a big one. And as William says, investors in private equity are essentially hedged because they are investing in a portfolio of companies. Um, and if you're particularly concerned about um, uh, uh, the abilities of one private equity house, um, you can always fail to invest in its next fund because as William says, they live and die by fundraising. Um, there are other types of private equity investment you can make in fund funds, uh, fund managers who specialize in taking investment from the pension funds insurance companies and then in turn uh, themselves being the LPs in a range of other people's funds and that gives you even broader diversification of risk if you want it. Anything to add to that William? No, okay. If not, no. Um, um, perhaps we can pull the threads together in terms of the fund element of how private equity works by looking at the structure of a simple fund to see how legally it all works together. Um, and 
this is one of the reasons why there are lots of lawyers involved in private equity. There are a, a, a type of lawyer who specialise on in fund formation, and fund formation involves lots of documents and lots of contractual relationships. And uh, the different arrows, by and large, reflect different contractual relationships between the parties who the arrows join up. Now, the limited partners are those on the left of the slide, the external investors, who might come in for tax and regulatory reasons through an intermediate vehicle, a feeder vehicle, or they might come in directly. But ultimately, they are investing in the limited partnership, the fund, which is the fund. And one point uh, uh, to emphasize is that if a limited partner commits to invest, say, $100 million uh, in a private equity fund, it doesn't have to write a check for the full amount on day one. The money is drawn down over a period of time. Uh, when portfolio company investments are made. So if William invests in Dorna, and that requires from that limited partner uh, a $10 million investment, that $10 million investment will only be drawn down when the Dorna deal is completed. So it's a commitment on the part of limited partners to provide money in the future rather than the writing of a check. Um, we were talking about the incentives, or William was, or, uh, uh, of the private equity house and the individuals that work in it. And those fee arrangements are all dealt with in the middle right and the far right side of the, uh, the diagram. So uh, the executives like William will themselves invest in the fund through uh, an intermediate vehicle. Um, and that intermediate vehicle will receive the carry uh, that he was describing, um, typically 20% uh, of the excess gains above uh, the hurdle, and then distribute that carry uh, out to individual executives in proportions that are set out in a document uh, evidencing constituting the intermediate vehicle in which they uh, invest. And that document will cater for things like what happens if a private equity executive leaves that house. What happens to his carry? Um, uh, um, uh, uh, and it will legislate uh, for a range of other uh, possible eventualities involving the individuals. And now William talked about the co-invest. That might be dealt with uh, by the individuals investing money through that same intermediate vehicle as holds the carry. Or quite often, it's a, a separate vehicle again. This is why I describe this one uh, as a simple diagram. Um, each limited partnership has a general partner. And the one problem with general partners is they are the, the single entity in a limited partnership that has unlimited liability. Because of that, it is invariable for most of the functions uh, involved in the running of a fund not to be dealt with by the general partner, but by an investment advisor that will be part of the private equity house, Bridgepoint say, or by um, Bridgepoint itself, which might take over management of the uh, uh, partnership from the general partner. Uh, uh, whichever it is, uh, the, the management fee will flow through the general partner, usually characterized as a priority profit share um, payable to the general partner from the monies it has available that will then flow to the investment advisor and the manager as a fee for what it is doing for the general partner in either advising on investments or effectively managing the activities of the fund. And depending what the general partner does, and there'll be one set up for each new fund raised, it might or might not be regulated. The investment and the advisor and the manager will be regulated uh, entities. Um, so that's the way a um, private uh, that's the way a private equity fund is legally constituted. Um, and uh, to the question about careers in private equity, this is one path.
We're now going to go on for the remainder of the lecture until towards the end, when we'll touch on current trends, to talk about how it works at the deal level. I'll do this given that time is running short in a relatively abbreviated way, but I'll start this time uh, with a structure of a typical buyout. Um, if we were talking about venture capital uh, investment, it, uh, the structure would look uh, 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 different to this one. And that's because um, venture capital money is put into target by the ultimate investors um, for two main purposes. Uh, one is to provide an exit, sometimes partial, for the founders, and the other, um, uh, and most common, it is to provide money for what it would usually be a young company to develop, uh, the investment money to, to enable it to develop to it, the next stage of its maturity. In the buyout, as the name suggests, most of the money is used by NUCO3, which is the acquirer in this diagram, to acquire the target. There will be money for investment as well, but most of the money will be used for the target. So where does the money come from? Well, it comes from the investor, which is the private equity house. That's what the term we're using in this diagram for the private equity house. And it will put its money into two main types of instrument, very much the minority, often only 1% of the total it is putting in. So 1 million out of 100 million in William's example at the beginning of the lecture will go into ordinary shares of NUCO. And the balance, 99 million in William's example, will go into NUCO too, um, probably as a, a loan note. It might go into NUCO one as a preference share, or it might be a combination of the two. But either way, that instrument, the preference share or loan note, will have a fixed return on it, typically 10%. It won't have any ability to generate a return on top of that fixed return of 10%. That's, that, uh, that unlimited potential rests with the ordinary shares. And the managers of the people, Bridgepoint, the senior executives, the C-suite, Bridgepoint is backing to run this group on a day-to-day -day basis and implement the strategy Bridgepoint agrees with those managers. And they will hold shares, ordinary shares in UK1. I'll explain how that incentivization piece works in a minute. The UK money, UK1 money will then flow down to UK2. And it'll be joined at the UK3 level by money from uh, debt providers who these days can themselves be um, credit funds established by private equity houses, or they might be banks, or they might be some other independent provider. Now, there is a type of debt finance called mezzanine finance, and that will probably come in at the new CO2 level rather than the new CO3 level, and would flow down with the so-called equity monies to new CO3, joining up with the uh, senior debt monies in new CO3 to provide what is needed to buy the target. Uh, and uh, that money will then flow out to those who own the target before completion as uh, the proceeds for the sale of their shares in target to NUCO3. Um, and what lawyers do, I mean, these deals are full of lawyers. And if you're acting for the investors, um, it, you will do four main things. You'll negotiate the documents between the investors and the managers. You'll act for the NUCO stack. Um, NUCO 3 in negotiating the sale and purchase agreement between NUCO 3 and the target. Um, NUCO 3 and perhaps NUCO 2 in negotiating the terms on which debt is provided um, by the debt providers. And on behalf of the investors and effectively the debt providers, you'll be undertaking due diligence, legal due diligence in, the, uh, in relation to the target company shares. And every party in this diagram will have a separate uh, law firms acting for them. Now, it's vital to understand um, the way the management incentivization works in uh, private equity. Um, this is how alignment is achieved between Bridgepoint and those running the companies that it invests in. Uh, management aren't required to invest in 
the instrument comprising 99% uh, in my example, or 19, in the instrument comprising 99% of what Bridgepoint puts into its deals, the loan notes and the um, uh, preference shares. They are only required in a first time buyout to invest in what is called sweet equity, sweet because that's all they have to subscribe for. And the amount of money that they have to pay for their shares, um, typically it will be 20% of the ordinary shares. I mean, it'll vary depending on the size of the deal and other characteristics of it, but 20% is not an uncommon amount. The amount they have to pay for them will depend on their own personal resources. So Bridgepoint will want um, management to have so-called skin in the game to, uh, for their investment to comprise a sufficiently large part of their commercial, of their personal assets, for them to focus hard on generating value for both themselves and for Bridgepoint, but not so much that they're lying awake at night wondering about how much risk they're taking and ha having had to put their house uh, up by way of um, a collateral to finance the amount of money they're having to put in for their ordinary shares. So it might be management, and this wouldn't be untypical, will pay one million pounds, dollars, euros for their uh, ordinary share equity, say 20%, and Bridgepoint will therefore put in um, uh, 80, uh, um, 8 million for, uh, no, 9 million for its share, and the balance will go in by way of the loan note and the, uh, the preference share. Um, if you're familiar with the way house purchases work in the UK, it's like buying a house with a 99% mortgage. And then if, if you pay down a bit of the debt, which is the, the bit at the bottom, that house prices rise in value and all that value accrues to the ordinary shareholders, management and, uh, and, uh, and Bridgepoint, which is how the sort of returns we're talking about are achieved for Bridgepoint and even greater returns proportionately for management. Sorry, Louise, it sounds like somebody's got a question. Uh, they have. I've also. It also says William Paul is tied, typing an answer, so maybe I'll, I'll ask it now that you've got my attention anyway. And this is, goes back to the previous slide, actually, Chris, um, which is said to be very helpful, but the anonymous questionnaire says they're not clear what function NUCO2 performs. What can it do that one or three can't do? NUCO1 or NUCO2? Uh, that's a good, very good question. NUCO2 is there because um, in the old days, um, uh, it was possible to obtain tax relief on uh, loan note interest, interest that was put in by the investor, but the rules meant that that had to go into a different company to NUCO1. Now, it is still just about possible to get interest relief, uh, tax relief on that interest, and you still have a NUCO2 for that reason. But often deals involve mezzanine debt. And I probably should have had a line from debt providers in UCO2 as well. Um, and the senior debt providers will want the mezzanine debt structurally subordinated to it. And the mezzanine uh, uh, um, lenders will want um, the equity uh, providers, the ordinary share providers, and perhaps the loan note, uh, the preference share and loan note providers subordinated to it, which is why you have these different um, uh, companies and more than just NUCO1 and NUCO3, which on first blush, the questionnaire is quite right, might be the only ones required, but there are tax and structural subordination reasons why you have more companies involved than just those uh, those two, NUCO1 and NUCO3. Yeah, and that's, and that's what I was typing. I was typing um, more on, because the tax uh, uh, relief has disappeared so long ago now that I'd sort of forgotten about that actually, Chris, so thanks for reminding me, but um, the structural subordination, obviously, to the to the debt for the investor's loan notes, but also the priority ranking versus the equity. So it ensures that um, in a wind up situation, then uh, there is some kind of mechanism by which the investor can at least get some of their money back before uh, the ordinary shareholders do. Um, uh, so those are the main reasons, main reasons why. Okay. Um, when I started in the 1980s, um, the dynamics of M&A were very different to today, and the buy side effectively was the dominant um, partner in uh, the dynamic between the sell and the buy side. 
So it would be invariable for the purchasers, lawyers to draft the sale and purchase agreement for them to contain lots of warranties, the purpose of which is to allocate risk in relation to um, the target company. If it isn't as the buyers are expecting, they would hope to have a warranty that um, uh, 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 address the issue and to be able to sue the sellers and recover money. Um, uh, as private equity developed, it helped it change that dynamic. And from the 1990s onwards, uh, there's been an undersupply of good quality assets given the amount of money that is available in the hands of private equity houses and others to invest in them. And what then happened was that uh, a methodology for selling companies by auction developed. And the way that works, and this is the way most deals uh, um, are run these days, is an investment bank or similar advisor uh, is contacted by those wishing to sell a company, often a private equity house. Uh, uh, they together produce um, an information memorandum or other document describing the company, its business, and uh, its um, forecast performance over the next two, three, four, five years. And on the basis of that uh, document, approaches the market and those that are identified by uh, um, uh, the sell side as potential buyers who are invited to bid for it. Um, that usually uh, generates interest. Um, bids are put on the table based on that limited information and the uh, research that uh, the, uh, the, the potential buyers will have done. And typically four or five will be chosen to go through a a, to a second uh, round of the auction um, when a lot more information will be provided to those four or five. Um, that will be due diligence information reports written on, uh, on uh, the sell side, um, uh, uh, covering all sorts of different aspects of the, uh, the company being sold, but also a sale and purchase agreement. Uh, that will be sell side drafted. It'll contain skimpy warranties, often with very low cap, sometimes as low as a pound. So warranties have ceased to perform uh, in the old way, the same uh, risk allocation uh, purpose as they used to. And as part of the second round of the auction, um, uh, there will be a negotiation between the lawyers representing each of the potential buyers and those representing the sellers uh, about uh, the sale and purchase agreement. The sell side using the competitive tension to obtain the best contractual terms for the sale of uh, the company. Now, what has happened in the last few years is that um, warranty and indemnity insurance uh, has appeared on the scene and uh, is common in many deals. And a buyer may take out an insurance policy effectively over um, warranties and the insurer uh, uh, um, takes the place in risk allocation of what you used to see in the sale and purchase agreement where the sellers would assume that risk. I know, William, you're quite cynical about the value of warranty and indemnity insurance. I don't know if you want to say a word about yeah. that. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, unfortunately from, from, from having been slightly burnt by it, um, I think there are two very important um, factors just to bear in mind there. And I think the first is probably more important which is um, sort of the disclosure process is an incredibly important part of our due diligence. Um, and, you know, that final nudge, you know, in the last 24 hours before signing of getting the disclosure letter out from the management team, um, which is where the real warts come out, um, you know, is a really, really important process. And there's nothing like, to use Chris's term, having some real skin in the game um, to make sure and motivate management to um, do that process really, really thoroughly. If you have a product in place, a warranty insurance product in place that effectively absolves them of sort of liability on that, you have to just ask yourself the marginal question, have they really gone the extra mile on that? And, and unfortunately, I did have a process where uh, I think they didn't go the extra mile on that because the warranty coverage was um, 
the insurance coverage was sort of too comprehensive um, with those caps that uh, that Chris was referring to. But unfortunately, they're market practice. They're kind of accepted by the market. So, you know, it was it was what it was. And if you fight these points very hard, you become uncompetitive vis-a-vis uh, -vis the management teams. The second point is, of course, they're written by very, very um, expert insurers who are the world's best um, uh, people at knowing how not to pay an insurance claim when the time comes. So actually the effectiveness of the product, if, if you, you know, in your one in a hundred uh, chance uh, that you need it is also a little bit in doubt. So, so I'm, I'm not a fan, but I also know that that's not where the market is. So, so you have to bear that in mind as you compete for a deal out there uh, against, uh, against our competitors. Great. Um, now, when I was practicing in the 1980s, very, very little due diligence was done on um, uh, target companies. Uh, what buyers relied on was um, uh, the disclosure letter that was uh, written in respect to the warranties. The way that works is that warranties are set out in a sale and purchase agreement, but to the extent a seller knows of something that would breach them, it writes it down in a disclosure letter that is presented to uh, the buyer. And to the extent something is set out in that letter, a claim can't be brought under the warranties. And that was the principal due diligence that was take, that took place in the 1980s in relation to a private M&A deal. Now there is very, very sophisticated um, uh, due diligence covering many, many different aspects of uh, a target company. Uh, there might be in, in tax, insurance, environment, pension, property, you name it. Um, the, the other uh, change uh, is the involvement of management in um, uh, uh, private equity deals. They are now significant players um, because of the equity stake they take. They have become now quite sophisticated in the, the part they play in processes, taking advantage of this sell side dynamic if uh, they are allowed uh, a role, which they often are, appointing their own lawyers and sometimes their own financial advisors to try to use the competitive tension of the second uh, round of an auction uh, to drive the best terms for them in terms of their ultimate equity stake and the legal terms which evidence it. So in a, in a buyout, there are inevitably hundreds of people involved, um, uh, lots of lawyers, uh, lots of uh, other advisors, lots of due diligence providers. Now, I'm going to skip over most of the next few slides, given we're running out of uh, time. Um, I will just dwell for a second on the equity documents. They're the ones that describe the relationship in legal terms between the management team, that uh, the C-suite that um, William is backing, and uh, Bridgepoint, using uh, uh, Bridgepoint as an example. And that is how, in legal terms, um, governance is evidenced. And the contractual arrangements in relation to private equity are one of the principal ways in which the agency issues are minimized and mitigated. They provide the way, legally, of Bridgepoint having oversight over its investment, strategic input into what is going on, control over who they are backing to run it so they can uh, uh, flood a board if they want to, to ensure that their point of view always prevails. They can sack those they're buying if they're backing, if they're not um, coming up to scratch. And they monitor it all by having information provided to it as a matter of con contract under the equity documents on a regular basis. They have input contractually on key issues which can't be taken without their consent and on uh, future business plans which can't be adopted without their consent. And that's where the ultimate exit will be regulated in part as well, anticipating what might happen in a few years time and providing pointers as to who will do what in relation to an exit. Now, I will skip over the debt documents, so have a look at them on the slides and we can pick up some of the detail in the seminar on Monday if you'd like to uh, dwell a bit more on uh, uh, these legal aspects, the contractual aspects of a transaction. But I think um, to conclude, we ought to have a look at current trends. And William, I think you're going to pick this up. Um, 
we do have one question, which I think is a sort of current trend question, if that's okay to raise it now, um, which is, and, and I don't know, Daniel, if you could make um, Sharath a, 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 a panelist just for a minute. Sorry, I don't know. He's on his way. Yes, good, thank you. I think this is the, the something that's asked about um, the uh, um, position of managers. Yes, here we go. Uh, hi, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Professor Galifa. Uh, my question was that uh, while PEs have generally increased the role for managers, we read in our textbook that in the start of the PE, say maybe 30, three decades ago, managers were given more stake than currently they are given in a PE setup. So uh, how, like in your experience, how much has this reduction of stake been for managers in a PE, like the equity that's given to the managers? And is there a regional variation on this, like across, say, the U UK and the US, uh, the amount of equity given to managers? Uh, Chris, well, you... uh, shall I take that first, William? Perfect. I'll do the legal bit. I, I, I quite often ask the managers on um, uh, bigger deals, and I, I, I haven't seen a, a trend of managers getting uh, in Europe less equity. In fact, it's probably the other way around because managers uh, have more recently started using their position in the uh, sale process to drive better deals for them. Um, uh, not always the case, but that is the case. So I'd be interested to know what data you're referring to that might show that, but that's not my experience. And I don't think that would be the experience of all that many. And William may have a view on that. Now, the way incentivization works in most European countries is different to the US. Uh, in Europe, it's always um, uh, 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 structured so that managers take a direct ordinary share stake for which they purchase. In the US, it's more quite often dealt with by way of options to purchase stakes um, in the future. And the reason it's dealt with as um, direct stakes in Europe is because of the big tax difference between um, uh, 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 selling an ordinary share and uh, later paying to exercise an option. One is within the capital gains tax rates, which still are much lower. Ob obviously, lots of speculation recently about that changing because of the finance holes in national uh, budgets that have been created by uh, the COVID support measures, but still very much lower than income tax and op options would be taxed at income tax rates. Um, but William, I don't know whether you uh, you would agree with what I've just said or whether your experience is different to that? No, Chris, I, I, I fully agree, actually. And, and if anything, I think there are there are two factors at, at play. Um, I mean, just to pick up on Sarath's uh, trend, I mean, the one, the one reason why managers' stakes would look smaller over time is possibly if you're measuring them against deals that are in general larger over time. Uh, and certainly one of the things that we think about when we're determining what sort of level of equity incentivization plan we want to put in place is what is the total value of that plan over a five year period and um, and certainly for the largest deals so when you're talking into the 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 mega deals that are done by the kkrs and the and the so on you know 20 percent of the equity in those deals is an awful lot of money and therefore you will find that by definition in the very largest deals the sweet equity percentages will be smaller because the absolute value that they generate is sufficient to incentivize a team of you know top team of 10 20 or 50 people whatever it whatever it might be i think there is um there is one interesting qualitative difference between the uk well uk straight europe and the us which is that actually the role of management teams is actually quite different in a process. And everything that Chris has said about managers being more central in the sale process, using their position a little bit more to negotiate with equity houses being more competitive and using management suite equity as a competitive tool, let's say. Um, in the US, it's very different. The managers tend to be much more neutral, much more middle of the road. They tend not to try and influence those discussions as much because it's 
um, it's not the way it's done. Actually, in reality, um, in many cases in the US, uh, management um, may not participate in the sale process at all, other than perhaps to give the management presentation. So there's just a cultural difference in terms of the role and participation of management in a sale process. That's not necessarily the same, of course, once you're actually in the company and you're and you're managing it because the culture is still to manage the investment through the management team. So hopefully that gives you a couple of uh, interesting um, points of contrast on, on, on those, two those two points that you make there, Sarah. Okay, Duff, thank you very much. L Louise, we're sort of reached six o'clock now. I don't know whether we... We got... have. I mean, I think we ought to, to call an end to it very shortly. I mean, would you like to just make a few of your current trends, perhaps particularly William, because most, I think, of the people who are going to be at the seminars on Monday will have the benefit of asking you more questions and hearing your thoughts again, Chris. Um, and if there's anything William would like to add on the current trends, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think the first uh, thing to say is, um, you know, private equity is, is, you know, where 20 years ago, it was still a relatively uh, under the radar niche, not generally very well understood industry. I think it is much more mainstream. It is much more a uh, cornerstone of the sort of the, co the corporate finance uh, community, let's say. Um, and I think that will only carry on increasing. Um, we've talked about the um, position that it has in, in the economy and in industry as a whole. I think you will see uh, the skills that are being or have been developed by private equity develop even further in the future. I think the two things I would just say is um, a lot of the investors, the LP community, are realizing that it is quite attractive to be able to invest in private equity directly. And so you're seeing some of the LPs, some of the pension funds actually starting their own private equity uh, uh, activities internally. And actually, are our investors becoming our competitors at the same time? Um, so I think that's an interesting point to bear in mind as, as, um, as, as we go forwards. It's certainly a means by which they can get access to deals more cheaply if they invest directly alongside us. Um, they don't pay the management fee and the carry incentive on the on the direct investment piece. So it is a way of them accessing um, lower cost investments that are still very, very attractive um, indeed. And I think the second thing I would say is um, it's been a, an incredible 20 years for the industry and the, the level of change uh, and increase in competition has been huge. But I think that that is going to continue. It is a very competitive market. There is a lot of capital out there, as we demonstrated. Hopefully, you will see that there's a lot more capital to come. Um, with all of that, its profile will increase. With all of that, it's um, uh, uh, it, the importance of being responsible investors that are well regarded by the community that respond in a corporate uh, minded way to challenges in society and in the economy, I think is going to make uh, this industry uh, be ever more transparent, be ever more front foot in terms of its role and its activities. Regulation will continue to increase. And I think you'll see certainly um, the question of corporate governance certainly, but um, uh, ESG more broadly being an incredibly important theme going forwards for us. So uh, exciting times, but yet more exciting times to come. Thank you very much. Um, we do actually have one more question, but what I'm going to do, I think if it's okay, is to bring the formal part of the meeting to a close. Now we'd all be going off to have drinks now and you'd all be able to talk to Chris and William over drinks and then we wouldn't have to worry about that. Um, so, but I'm going to, uh, as it were, bring it to a close so that people can, can go and also to formally thank William and Chris for you know, this fantastic lecture. It's always very, very interesting. I get the benefit of hearing it every year so I can see how trends develop and how things uh, have developed over the years. Um, but I hope everyone uh, agrees with me that we, we, you know, it's been incredibly interesting and thank you for your willingness to answer uh, so many questions. That's been absolutely uh, great.